After leaving Port Lincoln, our next stop is the town of Penishaw on Kangaroo Island. Our day starts a bit hectic. Our tenders are running late and we're about a half an hour late for our tour. Luckily, they held the bus and we're soon on our way. Welcome to Kangaroo Island. So Kangaroo Island is the third largest island in Australia. Uh, I got here in 1987. There were four and a half thousand people living on the island then. 2017, uh, 2018 I should say. Uh, guess what? Still only four and a half thousand people. Really? Yeah, so our population has not increased, uh, but it has certainly changed, especially in the last uh, 15 to 20 years. Tourism. Tourism has changed Kangaroo Island in a big way. Um, so when I got here, uh, it was all about farming, sheep and wool, mainly wool. Wool and uh, wheat was the main crop back then. And of course the big crash came in uh, about 1989, 1990. And we lost uh, 30% of our farms here on the island. At first I thought these were more cockatoos, but they're actually little corrals. Kangaroo Island's also known for their honey. And after a two hour drive, our first stop is at a honey farm. Welcome to Clifford's Honey Farm on this beautiful day. My name's Bev and we have three generations of my family working on Clifford's Honey Farm. We have native bees in Australia and on Kangaroo Island we also have the native Australian bees. And Kangaroo Island was chosen for the Italian honey bee from Liguria. They're known to be some of the most gentle, non-aggressive honey bees in the world. And this is the last place that where they remain the most pure in the world due to the isolation and having them brought here and a sanctuary declared way back in the early 1880s. And also they have a good genetic trait of being very productive. So when you think about that, that's less bee stings and more honey, which is a win-win, isn't it, for everyone? We've got these stainless steel machines that are for specifically for beekeepers and they are designed and made for beekeepers in Australia and the same sort of designs are around the world. So this is not exclusive to us, this is common beekeeping. Harvesting the wax, we can collect up to half a ton of wax in one day. So we can harvest half a ton of wax at the most, and one day five tons of honey with this machine here. So the wax harvest is the very first machine, which is a hot knife, um, automatic knife. So the very top cell of the comb, when it has honey inside, is removed. And I have a comb here that we can all pass around and closely look at. So what the bees do is they fill up the little cell with nectar and the enzymes that the bees have in their body when it comes out of their body stays with the nectar and then they fan their wings and together with enzymes and wing fanning, the nectar changes to honey. Honey is naturally antibacterial and has no expiry date. If you have pure honey, you don't have to eat it by a certain time. Our tasting started out with a honey drink, after which we bought some honey ice cream. The best part was sampling the different honeys with each bite of ice cream. We're soon back on the bus for some more driving and information on the native plants. Just here on the right hand side, those are all branches coming out of the ground and the main trunk of the tree is underground. And uh, that's the difference between a mallee uh, gum tree and normal gum trees. Um, there are 300 different types of mallee throughout Australia. And the, and the thing about Melly here on Kangaroo Island, uh, it's where all our kangaroos and wallabies like to roost during the daytime. And for a couple of reasons. Um, it protects them from the sun is the main reason. Uh, and also uh, they can get away from predators. So they can move through those. Uh, oh, there's a dent. I'll pretend well, I can see that. Oh, no, no, that's just oh, coming out. Uh, as long as it didn't come through the window. We are heading toward the Hanson Bay Wildlife Sanctuary, where after lunch we'll be able to look at some local animals in their native habitats. This area was a little strange. They had different colored ribbons tied to the trees, indicating that there had been sightings of koalas or even a mother koala with her joey. In the heavy underbrush we heard some noise, so we quietly investigated. They were wallabies that carefully watched us while they were hidden in the bush. Off in the distance we saw some kangaroos. They didn't seem very concerned as we slowly approached them. 
On Kangaroo Island, they're trying to get rid of introduced species, especially those that hunt the small animals and birds. So they're putting a ban on all cats, hoping to have the island free of all feral and domestic cats by 2030. We were soon joined by some of the other visitors, but it was time to get going. Yeah, we disturbed them out of their shade. Yeah. The brush seems to go on forever, as our driver points out why we see some of these dead trees in the distance. All from that fire in 2007, and I've been told by National Parks it'll be about four years before all these dead trees fall back in the undergrowth. Uh, and of course, you know what happens then, they all become uh, fuel for the next fire. Mm -hmm. And it's not a matter of if we have another fire, it's just when. We've been passing a large amount of roadkill, and our driver explains that locally those are called wazaroos. Entering Flinders Chase National Park, we see the large weathered granite formations called Remarkable Rocks. Nearby, also in Flinders Chase National Park, is Admiral's Arch. Our last stop was our driver's favorite beach on Pennington Bay before catching a tender back to the ship. It's the national holiday called Australia Day and today we're in Adelaide. We start our day with a tour by Holland America which takes us to the Botanical Garden. It looks like it could be a nice place but we only have 30 minutes to run through it on our own. Outside the gardens were these enormous ficus trees, and we couldn't resist snapping a few pictures. As we were boarding the bus, we saw these giant fruit bats, also known as flying foxes. Our next stop was at the South Australia Museum for a quick guided tour. Again, this looked like it could have been an interesting stop, but we were only given 30 minutes for the tour. Our ship is docked in Port Adelaide, a 30 minute train ride from town. After having a quick lunch on board, we're back exploring Rundle Mall.
Our plans are to head to Elder Park for an Australia Day concert. But first we find a spot on the street to watch the international themed Australia Day Parade. After the parade, it was easy to find Elder Park by just following the crowd. This was one of the few displays of the Aborigine culture that we saw on the trip. This was a military display with a 21 cannon salute. The sound of the cannons were like giant explosions. And you could feel the air just vibrate with the noise. Wanting to beat the crowds, since a rugby game was just letting out, we headed toward the crowded trains before the fireworks show. We're up early to catch the first train in the town, but unfortunately the gangway is misbehaving and we're stuck on board for an hour. We're heading for the Adelaide Central Market, the largest covered market in the Southern Hemisphere. Not for us. Not for us. We were able to do a fair amount of sampling and we bought a few goodies of our own, including this salted caramel tart. That night on the ship, they had an extensive array of exotic fruit and seafood that looked like it came directly from the market. Next, we're heading for two days in Tasmania, 
one of the most exciting places we visited in Australia.